Hi, I'm Rachel Williams, Chief Editor of Pool & Spa Professional. I'm here from the show floor at the PSP Deck Expo with Randy Tumber, who is President of Tumber International Landscape Training. Randy, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Well, I wanted to start off by asking you a little bit about your design philosophy, which leans towards naturalistic design. Can you tell us about that and why that's been your preference? Yep. Years ago, when I first got into landscape ing, as it were, um, I very quickly realized that it was a very transient um, way of doing things. Uh, you may remember the red zigzag lockstone of the 70s, and then the exposed aggregate of the 80s, and all the lockstone swirls and circles of the 90s, and so forth. And so many things that the trends that just kept on coming and going. And I always wanted to be some of, like some of these leading edge architects. Until after a while, it started to occur to me that wait a minute, these aren't cutting edge ideas. These are ideas that are driven by the manufacturers who are going to the architects and saying, here, use our stuff. And I thought, I'm starting to get clients phoning and saying, can you come and rip out all this stuff that's passe now and put in something that isn't going to keep changing the fads and the trends and everything. And it became evident to me that the only thing that will stand the test of time that doesn't constantly get diluted is natural elements, natural stone, natural plant material, natural styles. And so <clears throat> I, I very quickly realized that I had a lot to learn, so I started to study as much as I could about what I could discover in creation and how one thing equates to another and the symbiotic relationships that, that are woven throughout the entire ecosystem. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to try to, to do my best to create something that will stand the test of time and that transcends all of these passing fads. And um, lo and behold, I found a niche, albeit a, a very small one, but I have found that that appeals to a lot of people. But I also realized that I was going to sacrifice a lot of my potential workload, and I'm okay with that. I've been down the road of a bunch of guys and three construction crews and a maintenance crew, and all I did was run myself ragged, and I found that I got more satisfaction out of pulling it back down to one project at a time, one crew, and we did everything in-house other than gas and electrical. And by doing that, we were able to have full control of the way things were. So we utilized things like natural stone and wood and water and, and all those kinds of things that we see around us because it, it occurred to me that nobody doesn't love nature. So I went down that rabbit hole, if you will, and um, I, it just kind of expanded from landscaping design to construction to aquatics to native habitat restoration natural stonework, all these kinds of things, and they all flowed very nicely together. And I, 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 my mantra is, we make believers one person at a time. And we truly do with each client. And they say, oh my goodness, I wish I had to call you sooner. These ideas make so much sense. And now there's a huge movement with everyone trying to save the planet, which is a noble intention. But until you understand how these uh, natural ecosystems function with each other, you can't really um, develop it and build around that. So I've tried to do that and I try to stay away from the things that are so lineal and, and uh, square, flat, one dimensional, chrome stainless steel glass. I, I just don't see that in, in natural environments. So I try to create something that is natural in, in approach, in appeal, and in function. So we use native plant materials wherever possible. We integrate the water features into them in a very natural way. And uh, we've had a, a good following along those lines. And it's been very good to me. Great. Well, one of the benefits you just mentioned was eco-friendliness. So can you tell our audience a little bit more about you know, how this naturalistic design style uh, also benefits uh, the planet, as you said. Well, again, um, something as simple as permeable pavers, rather than, uh, I mean, we would all, the first thing you do in landscaping is you have to address stormwater management. 
well, instead of trying to express the water off the property as quickly as possible, down the gutter, into the storm drain, into our creek, and into our lakes and our oceans, and sending all the pollutants and windshield washer, antifreeze, transmission fluid, motor oil, gas, diesel, all, everything, rubber, we try to deal with the water on site. Each, each individual property, we deal with it on site. So permeable pavers is a prime example of that. Let it percolate down, let it get filtered through natural processes and go back into the aquifers and recharge our aquifers because we're all wanting for fresh water. And so it, it's one of the things that, that kind of dovetails nicely with everything else that we're doing. So we, we plant things up in such a way that the, the root system is going to get well established. It's native. It's as close to zero maintenance as you're going to get. And we use ground covers and natural mulches and things like that. Try to avoid, again, some of the more trendy things like the black mulch with the dye in it and where they're using um, too much recycled wood, recycled pallets with potential hazardous materials that have been spilled on them in warehouses or whatever, or pressure treated lumber decking that's been pulled out and recycled, and then they put a pretty color into it and then market it as recycled. Well, okay, it is recycling, but it's putting toxic stuff, potentially toxic stuff, into the gardens. But there's so much hardwood in the pallets that um, in order for that to decompose through natural processes, it takes so much um, out of the soil and it actually short circuits the plant food process because the plants need the decomposing wood and bark, etc., in order to provide the micronutrients to survive, and yet the hardwood takes way, way too much out of it. So we don't want to shortchange the plants. So if we use in Canada, we use um, we try to use the 100-mile rule, so you don't truck the stuff halfway across the country. But spruce, pine, fir, cedar, a bit of hemlock from the local mills, and it's ground up, and they use the bark and just the tender stuff. And so we put that on two or three inches thick, and that provides the natural base to um, retard weed growth and to um, insulate the roots from the hot sun to retain moisture. And it also, as it's breaking down, it provides micronutrients for the for the, the plant food process. So you're working in harmony with the, what we find in creation. That's that's my big goal. So there's lots of benefits from working, understanding how does this natural cycle work? How can I make it that I fit into it rather than forcing it to fit me? Well, that's a very important point, and it's great to hear that you not only focus on that with your design but also with the suppliers that you're using. Um, and kind of in line with that, another element uh, to your design is utilizing water features. So how can other designers implement water features in a very natural way where it really uh, blends into the backyard living environment? Yeah, that, that's another thing that I have uh, actually narrowed my, my market to a very niche market because not everyone likes the old fashioned kidney shaped pools or free form pools or things like that. It's not trendy, it's not contemporary, but if you go back to the 1950s and 1960s and look at some of the old pools, and uh, I mean, all it is is the cycles go like this and then like this and like this and everything. And I just say, you know what, I don't want to do that. Um, the, the square rectangle things have their place and some of the most spectacular pool water features I've ever seen are ones where they've they've designed and built them like that, like the, the, some of the Genesis stuff, like Brian and, and uh, Skip stuff is, is breathtaking. Very justice people like that. I've seen the things that it takes my breath away. But I I can't subscribe to that because I don't know how. I don't have that training. My 40 odd years has been focused towards the, the study of what I see in the natural environment around me and then trying to develop that. So not each client wants that and I respect that. And I would never put myself in a place where I would pretend to know how to do that. But what I do know how to do is something that appeals to many people that live in a, in a rural country estate uh, situation. So based on that, I try to do whatever I can to make sure that when it's put in there, it actually uh, feels like it belongs. So we'll place rocks that we've uh, 
acquired from the Niagara Escarpment with horizontal lines with moss on them and things like that. So when you place that rock into a waterfall or beside a pool edge as a retaining wall or by a fire pit terrace, those kinds of as soon as it's put in there, it looks like it's been there for 10,000 years right now, right now. And so a lot of our water features, the people will look at them and say, wow, that's gorgeous. It's so nice that you that you built this house around all these beautiful waterfalls and everything. And what part did you do? And then you show them the before picture and it was like this flat piece of ground in a subdivision. All of a sudden it's like, oh my goodness, this looks like the Rocky Mountains. This is awesome, it's beautiful. Well, that's good. We just made one more believer. And that's how it goes. So that's, my idea is, Although the waterfalls flowing into the pool are, are, are very cool and look, can look very, very chic and um, I, again, as I mentioned, I don't pretend to know how to do that. But what I do know how to do is to try to create it so that it looks natural. Water naturally erodes away the ground and all the loose and the fines get washed out until it gets back into harder ground. Look at Niagara Falls, it's a great big crescent or the Horseshoe Falls because it has eroded away and worked its way back and continues to do so. So when you're building a waterfall, have it recessed back in, not standing out with this monolithic rock with water spewing out of it. It's better if it's cut back in and it looks like it has eroded away and that allows you to have a river mouth, if you will, for better presentation more natural subconscious acceptance. It also allows you to project the acoustics a certain direction. With the echo chamber here or here, like um, the tuning of water features is a, is a seminar in itself. But there's three distinct sounds in water feature. The bong sound and the hissing sound, the babbling brook sound. So when you're sitting poolside or you're sitting on a terrace, a fire pit terrace or whatever beside a stream, um, it's, it's cool if you can have the elevator music in the background, like the hissing sound, the babble of books, and that's nice, so that you, you can have a pleasant conversation in a normal tone of voice. Whereas the bong sound, that's the irritant, that's the one that makes everyone have to go to the washroom all the time. So you would project that to an area where you would have a vantage point way far away, you want to project that and the static water level will carry the sound as you know on a lake you can hear people whispering on the shore. So you can project that bong sound a long distance, but you don't project it towards the area that's intimate. So you would project that to somewhere where you had a vantage point way far away, but then you keep the pleasant sounds, the friendly sounds close by, especially in a situation with an indoor waterfall. You say to the people, so you lay, oh yeah, we love it, it's awesome, it's awesome. Are you sure it's not too loud? No, no, no problem at all. And then about, we walk out the door going, ha, 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 give them a couple of weeks, they'll call. And sure enough, within a couple of weeks, hey, Randy, how are you doing? Good, 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 how's the waterfall? It's great, except one thing. What's that? Like, I didn't know what's coming. My wife says she has to go to the bathroom all the time. Ah. So then we go back and we start to employ the techniques that we installed to detune the waterfall until it gets to an acceptable level. And you can use it to buffer road noise and all kinds of things and to mitigate noise that is objectionable and introduce that pleasant lilt of flowing water, rattling brook. The sunlight picks up the white water, so you walk in, your eye catches it, your eye, your ear catches it, your eye comes to it, and then you go, you have just made a journey that you don't even know because you just went from visual emotional you just appeal to the heart so if you can evoke an emotional response from what you've designed and constructed and made it number one functional number two realistically maintainable and number three aesthetically pleasing I believe you've accomplished the goal that you've planted in your clients hearts as I said not everybody wants to go down that road but for the people that that kind of thing appeals to um, I derive great amount of pleasure providing that for them and again making believers one client at a time. Well that's great. That's an important takeaway. Thank you for teaching us a little bit more about naturalistic design. My pleasure.